I'm here to present a compiler runtime optimization, a fast pivot function for MIR Express Burger Library through vector vectorization and integer arithmetic in FPU. Let's get started with a mean. Floating points are very likely to be imprecise. They cannot get simple addition correct. For example, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2. However, they can be quite correct with integers, like 1.2 is always going to be 3. 11 plus 22 is always going to be 33. And 111 plus 222 is always going to be 333. The reason is how IEE754 works. There is one bit of sign, eight bits of exponent, and 23 bits in Mantisa. The value of this floating point data structure is the sign uh, times two, sub, uh, two to the exponent's power subtracts the base and times Mantisa. In this given example, the, uh, the decimal value in the expo exponent is, two, is 124. Subtracting the base, it becomes negative three, and multiplies the fraction, it becomes 0 0.15625. This, uh, the error of 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1 not equals 0 0.3 is because the conversion from a decimal fraction to a binary fraction. Some base 10 fractions cannot be represented finitely in base two, like the example we shown just now. But the, uh, the bits in the matrix are finite, there are only 23 bits for 32 bit floating points or 52 bits for the longer double floating point. Therefore, they have to be rounded and causing imprecision. This conversion problem does not exist in integer spaces because there is exact mapping from each binary integer to each decimal integer. Therefore, as long as the integers are not very big or very small, it won't cause imprecision problem. Therefore, if we assume that we only do uh, integer operations within a range and we only involve multiply and addition, such that when there is no division, uh, fractions won't be created in the progress, we can define an integer data type that uses the one bit sign and the 23 bit mantisa. We ca call it int 24. Our flow can be defined as the floating point in exactness rather than a strict limit on the number of bits that the integer have. And overflow can be captured by a floating point status register. This is the, M, the structure of MXCSR register. It provides a precision flag and the overflow flag to indicate whether the previous instructions have produced the overflow result or not. The biggest benefit of doing integer the arithmetic in floating point is that uh, we have this data structure and this, uh, equivalent, it, uh, we have this status register and this equivalent status register does not exist for vectorized integer operations in the x86 x microarchitecture. Uh, in x86, there is an instruction to indicate whether the previous integer add or multiply instruction have gone on the floor or not. But it only works for scalar instructions. For vectorized instructions, there isn't such, and we have to manually check if it is an overflow or not. For example, when, uh, when checking if an add is an overflow, we, after doing a conventional add, we do a saturated add, saturated add afterwards and compare if the results are the same. Saturated adds keeps the result at the maximum of the integer value. Uh, and, if, and if the result is different from the conventional add, it implies the overflow. Likely for multiply, we multiply both lower and higher half of the input. And if the higher half produce non-zero non results, it implies an overflow. The difference in floating point is that uh, we could use library functions to read and reset the, the status register such that overflow can be checked in only one second for all previous floating point computations. A common misconception in x86 is that, or generic computer architecture is that, floating points are going to be much slower than integers. For example, a computer architecture course may depict a scenario where, uh, for example, executing 100 instructions uh, in sequence, each integer add instruction takes one cycle, a floating point add instruction takes five cycles. Then if all the 100 instructions are integer add, it is going to be 100 cycles in all. 
but if there are floating points, then it will be 500 cycles. This is not the case in modern architectures as the execution units are, have pipelines. For example, in the first cycle, when the first instruction gets dispatched to the execution unit, in the second cycle, the uh, instruction can move to the second phase of the pipeline, and the first phase is empty, such that the second instruction can be dispatched on the second cycle to the first, first empty space in the pipeline. Therefore, the last instruction, the 100th instruction, can be dispatched on the 100th cycle and finish, finishes on the 104th cycle. Therefore, the throughput of both integer and float are approximately the same. This is confirmed by LVM, MCA, and Zen3, where uh, this is the microarchitecture diagram of Zen2 from Wikichip, and Zen3 is very similar to this. The C++ source code does an element-wise operation that multiplies and adds uh, values from two array and saves it to the destination array. After compiling and disassembling it using C long, targeting the Zen3 and enable vectorization, multiply, uh, manually finding the hot loop and uh, fit the six lines of instruction to LVM MCA, it is discovered that uh, the reverse throughput of the FMA instruction, fused multiply instruction, is 0 0.5, or the throughput is 2. This matches the, what the microarchitecture diagram shows us as there are two FMA execution units. In addition, the MCA also reports the execution takes 413 cycles in total uh, up by iterating this block 100 times. Here we change integer. Here we change floating point to integer, and because there isn't fused multiply add for integers, uh, we have to use one instruction for add and one instruction for multiply, and this doubles the instruction count. However, the microarchitecture provides four ALUs that are capable of doing either multiply or add. This doubles the instruction count, but also doubles the amount of execution units, causing a very similar total cycle. Going back to the pivot function, it provides, uh, it, its, its purpose is to solve linear programming problems using the simplex method. Linear programming is a mathematical optimization technique used to model and find the best possible solution to a problem using a set of constraints and object functions to maximize and minimize. For example, here, uh, here, uh, here is an example of uh, linear programming. Uh, we want to maximize the function z equals 40x1 plus 30x2, subjecting to the constraints where x1 is greater than zero, x2 is also greater than zero, and x1 plus 2x2 is less than, is equal to or less than 16, and x1 plus x2 is equal to or less than nine. And this can be converted into the matrix shown on the right. Solving this problem manually would require division and uh, this is very computationally extensive uh, operation for computers. When implementing the the pivot function, we multiply a denominator on each row such that the division can be eliminated, and the pivot function essentially does row operation by uh, multiplying and add every row to some const con constant value and the pivot row. And essentially, the function becomes an element-wise operation for each element with two multiplication and one addition. The previous works, the paper fast linear programming through transposition computing on small and sparse data, and the F FP or fast Pressburger arithmetic through transposition, have found that the pivot function is the main performance bottleneck of the Pressburger library. And it has also been discovered that most elements in the matrix have very small values, where 99% of the observed numbers fits in 16 in 16-bit integers. Therefore, the FPL paper presents a transposition implementation for the Pressburger library, and the core function is the pivot. It starts with int 16, and if it overflow occurs, it throws the exception, and it will be captured by the transposition dispatcher. It will uh, change the algorithm to int 64 or big int accordingly. However, in MLIR upstream, there 
there are only two layers of transposition from int64 to big int. This is because int16 is not a popular, this is because int16 requires AVX512, which is not popular, which is not a popular ISA. Another problem is that either int32 int or int64 can, uh, is orders of magnitude slower than int16 because as I mentioned just now, it cannot be vectorized. It requires, it, uh, the pivot operation requires overflow checking, but there does not exist vec vectorized overflow checking instructions to support int64 int and int32. Here I'm presenting a alternative approach using floating point rather than int16, where a 32-bit floating point number provides 24 effective bits to do integer operations. The benefits are free overflow checking and it has much better compatibility as floating points would only require AVX2 or even older AVX instruction sets to support it. But the cost is bit width as the bit width doubles and there will be double amount of memory operations. I selected a 19 column example from the FPL paper, a benchmark, benchmark toolkit and I have implemented a detached version of pivot function for all three data types. I measured the performance using Google Benchmark on a Zen 4 desktop logged at 4.5 gigahertz. It is discovered that both the int16 version and the float version are much faster than the upstream. And it is also found that the overflow overhead for floating point is a much smaller ratio comparing to int16. Unfortunately, the int16 is still faster, a few nanoseconds faster than float. The reason is that as we are doing two multiply and one add, but the architecture provides two FMA and two F add units, the floating point add units are left idle and only FMA units are participated in floating point operations. The other potential reason is that Zen4 is not good at register, load, and store. The previous LLVM MC report has indicated that it takes the throughput of uh, writing back from register to cache is one cycle per register. This magnifies the disadvantage of, of floating point. This is the end of my talk, and I have a discovery about LVM MCA. I was doing, I was playing around with it uh, by running a FMA by, by feeding it some FMA instructions on both the architecture Zen 2 and Zen 3. It is discovered that on Zen 2, the R throughput, reverse throughput is 0 0.5, but on Zen 3, it is 1, meaning that on Zen 2, the throughput is 2, and on Zen 3, it is 1 or Zen 2 is faster than Zen 3. As we know, Zen 2 is the success, as Zen 3 is a success of Zen 2, this is counterintuitive. And this does not match the, re the benchmark results that I have done on my own computers. I submitted the issue and it found that the scheduling information reported by MCA are manually generated using a, X, a, using a micro benchmark tool called LVM Exigences. And this is the end. Okay, great. Questions? Yeah, so first of all, a very uh, like creative approach at least to the problem. Uh, I have to admit I did not fully understand how the pivot function then basically works on the floating point numbers, but I wanted to ask whether you have any problems with rounding mode issues where like depending on the rounding mode, floating point, yeah, whatever operations would end up in different results depending on this rounding mode set or not. Uh, no, rounding problem is not uh, rounding is not a problem here because uh, first, all the numbers are very small, and second, if uh, if the overflow if floating point in precision bit is set, then uh, we capture it and reduce uh, the whole algorithm with a bigger data type. We don't really have to care about rounding here. Rounding should not occur in the first place. Okay, thanks. So let me, let me ask another question. So you had this um, benchmarks where you extracted the pivot function out of, out of the 
a real test case, right? Yes. So did you manage already to do end-to-end -end tests with actual, you know, the, the MLIR workflow and get some results there? I haven't. I didn't have enough time to do that. So fair point, fair point. I mean, it, it looks it looks really you know impressive on the on the performance improvement that you get by embedding. Things. Yes, indeed, because this is only the pivot function. There is a lot of overhead to that, so the actual performance won't be very impressive like this. I would have imagined, but it looks better that way. So maybe. Yes. <laughs> also, it is made intentionally with log scale so that the the uh, the. Floating point uh, overflow checking overhead is barely can't visible. <laughs> to emphasize that the, the the floating point data structure is very if very efficient when doing overflow checking. Right. I mean, to be fair, this is I mean the the, the basic idea behind this. We could do that in the compiler, you know, in different places. It, if we if we could expose that, have you thought about that at all? Uh, yes, I do. For example, implementing a like a, a computer architecture where it does not provide integer ALUs, like every integer, for example, 32-bit integer are done using 64-bit floating point units because it is compatible, it is, has 53 bits of uh, anti sign sign. I had this idea before. I have not, I don't know whether any uh, like uh, microcontroller manufacturer have implemented such, such a process. I mean, but I, it's, it's, it's a fun idea to think about, but as you said, while the throughput might be the same, the latency is not. So if you have you know, control dependencies on your integers. Indeed, indeed. Latency is bigger than integers. So that might be, that might be a reason we, we haven't seen that yet. But generally speaking, even like with the hardware we have, we could embed more into floating point operations. Yes. That sounds like a fun idea. All right. Let's thank the speaker again.